Want to know the secret to a happy, healthy pet? The answer might surprise you. Hey there, pet parents. I'm Dr. Katie Woodley, holistic veterinarian and founder of The Natural Pet Doctor. Today, we're unlocking one of the most overlooked keys to your pet's well-being, gut health. If you're passionate about giving your pet the best life possible, make sure to hit that subscribe button and ring the bell so you never miss out on tips to achieve that. Are you constantly guessing why your pet seems off from diarrhea to allergies? But what if I told you that many common problems actually stem from gut issues and you might be unknowingly contributing to them? In this video, you're going to learn what gut health really means for your pet, signs that indicate an unhealthy gut, and what you should absolutely avoid to protect your four-legged furry family member. So if you're committed to your pet's long-term health, stick around. This could be a game changer. So what is the microbiome? This is the key to health. The microbiome, it's trillions of tiny organisms that live inside your pet's gut. In fact, they actually outnumber your pet's own cells by 10 times. And these organisms, they include bacteria, viruses, fungi. They live in the mouth, respiratory tract, small and large intestines, kidneys, and even on the skin. And together, these communities are called the microbiome. A balanced, healthy microbiome helps your pet by helping them maintain a healthy body weight. It helps them absorb the nutrients from their food. It improves mood health. So listen up if you've got a grumpy pet or an anxious pet. It promotes healthy skin and coat quality. Yes, it can play a part in allergies. Support longevity and maintains a strong immune system. Very, very powerful. So why is gut health important? For all those reasons, from weight to mental health, the microbiome affects almost every single aspect of your pet's health and happiness. And that digestive system is actually responsible for the majority, so 70 to 80% of your pet's immune system. So an upset gut can actually result in reduced immunity, which potentially puts your pets at risk of falling ill. This is like us, we're super stressed out, you're more prone to getting sick, getting colds, and getting being out of work, right? Same thing with our pets. That's why it's so important to make sure your pet's gut is healthy, to keep them strong and happy. Makes us happier, right? So when the gut bacteria are out of balance, then we start seeing disorders like inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD for short, allergies, kidney disease, and even dental disease can result. And we're seeing this rise in microbiome associated disorders in our pets and ourselves. So it's really important, more important than ever, that we start taking better care of our pet's microbiomes. Where does it all begin? Your pet's gut was actually sterile when they were born. There was nothing in there. Your pet's first and most important dose of gut bacteria was actually inherited at birth from the mother. So those bacteria are gonna influence your pet for the rest of its life. However, the, the flora, the different types of bacteria in your pet's gut can actually shift with age and dietary changes and other things that we do to it, so stress environment. So like certain events like it, taking antibiotics, that can produce rapid shifts in the microbiome by killing off many of the good bacteria in addition to the bad ones. Studies show that it can actually take up to a year to recover the diversity that is lost from antibiotic usage. So going back to Mac at the beginning, every time he was getting more metronidazole or flagyl, that was killing off the good and bad bacteria. So now his system had to like restart, reboot every time, every time it was just getting wiped out. So we have to keep that in mind with the medications, the drugs, the things that we're giving to our pets. How is it affecting their microbiome? So what are some of these microbiome benefits? Most of the bacteria living in your dog's gut are friendly. They're healthy bacteria. They form little neighborhoods or what we call little microbiomes. And that's a good thing. 
So let's say your dog gets bit by a tick that's infested with Lyme bacteria, or your dog is naughty and raids the garbage can and devours a salmonella filled chicken carcass. Not good, right? Those harmful pathogenic bacteria, they enter your dog, but they need food and resources to live. And if your dog is lucky, he has trillions of those friendly good bacteria that are already sitting in his gut waiting. And those friendly bacteria actually compete for resources with the harmful bacteria and they starve the bad bacteria to keep your dog healthy. So those good bacteria, they can actually protect your dog from fungi like yeast as well as parasites in his gut. So they outcompete the bad stuff. Also, the gut bacteria produces short chain fatty acids. So these are molecules that are produced when dietary fiber ferments in the colon, which is due to the good bacteria. And these small chain fatty acids, they provide food for the cells that line your pet's colon, and they're important to maintaining overall colon health. They protect the intestinal lining against pathogens, and they also move food through the large intest intestine, and they're an essential part of nutrient absorption. So these short chain fatty acids, they help protect against diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, heart disease, and obesity. If you saw our DCM, so dilated cardiomyopathy and grain-free diet webinar a few months ago, we talked about these short chain fatty acids and the gut health and also how foods were leading to DCM. This is a big part of that, the taurine reabsorption in the colon. That's not being protected and able to happen. Our pets actually can develop these nutritionally responsive diseases. And so this is so important that we need to have sources of fiber in the diet for your pets for production of these short chain fatty acids. The gut's also known as the second brain. This is really cool, but it makes so much sense. And there's a good reason for that. When we think about it, your pet's gut and the brain are intimately connected. It's the same thing for us. And the gut brain access links the emotional and the cognitive centers of the brain with the gut. So when you're anxious, you get those butterflies in your stomach, that's why. And so if you have poor intestinal health, it actually affects your mood and stress levels. You don't ever feel good, right, when your stomach's upset. It's the same for your pet. So if your pet's friendly bacteria isn't keeping that digestive system healthy, they usually, they may not just show it by having loose stool, diarrhea, or a stomach ache, and they just don't wanna eat their food and they have low energy. They may also show it through the way that they feel mentally. How crazy is that? Okay, I hope you're listening up because these symptoms don't seem like they're related to the gut. However, there is a component of dysbiosis where that good bacteria is off compared to the bad bacteria. So if you're noticing weight loss, dull hair coat, autoimmune diseases, allergies, Sensitive GI tract, so that could be your pet doesn't want to always eat its food. That could be they vomit if they go too long in between meals. That could be they have loose stool if they eat something different, they get a new treat. Any sensitivity, they get stressed, they, they're anxious, and then they get diarrhea, dental disease, bad breath, even when the teeth are clean. That can be a sign that the gut bacteria is off. Inflammation, any type of inflammation. So arthritis, skin inflammation, any type of inflammation, ear infections that never seem to go away, they keep coming back, anxiety and thyroid issues. Hyperthyroidism typically is more common in cats and low thyroid in dogs. Does your pet fit any of those? So what leads to dysbiosis? If your pet has an imbalance of gut bacteria and there aren't enough good bacteria to defend them from the good guys or from the bad guys, that's known as dysbiosis. So the bad, bad bacteria outnumbers the good bacteria. Your pet's going to be more susceptible to disease and infection. And this leads to those symptoms that we see. So this is caused by so many different things, poor diet, antibiotics, steroids, vaccines, flea and tick products, other drugs, environmental toxins, glyphosate we're gonna talk about, Roundup. And this all leads to leaky gut over time. So your dog's intestinal wall, it's lined with a delicate mucous membrane that allows those digested nutrients to enter the bloodstream. 
think of it like a filter that it only should let tiny particles through and it protects the bloodstream from bigger pathogens, undigested food particles that are bigger, so it should be protecting them. But when your pet has dysbiosis, the mucosa of that GI lining gets inflamed and irritated. And what it does is that it causes bigger holes in that filter, letting larger food particles through, the bacteria can now get through, and toxins get through into the bloodstream. Not good. Now we have what we call leaky gut syndrome. This is when all those undigested food and toxins enter the bloodstream, and now the immune system goes into overdrive because it spots the foreign protein matter, and it goes into a battle mode against these invaders. The liver's trying to remove the toxins from the body, but because this is constantly happening, it can't keep up, and the undigested proteins and toxins are now being absorbed into the body's tissues. That's why we see inflammation throughout the body. That's why allergies are related to leaky gut, to the microbiome. It's all connected. So this inflammation increases every time your pet eats. Every time they eat food, they get a treat. And over time, this inflammation continues to get worse. Those intestinal holes, they get bigger and it allows even more undigested food to enter the body. Then what happens is, the foreign proteins now start to look like the body's own tissue proteins. So this is actually called molecular, molecular mim mimicry. And this can lead to the body actually producing antibodies against itself. So now we're entering the autoimmune realm. So this is why there's this whole cascade of inflammation and why we need to stop it at dysbiosis. So usually we see these autoimmune diseases, so that can include diseases of the skin, thyroid, joints, heart, eyes, brain, that can be in the bowel, liver, pancreatic problems, and then also behavior problems. If you have a pet that's super stressed out, this could be going on with them and we need to recognize it. Because if we leave that autoimmune disease unchecked, the chronic inflammation can lead to really serious diseases like cancer. So some of the causes of leaky gut, mentioned those briefly, we have diet, vaccination, steroids, Chlorinated water I put on there, yep. Fluoride too, I didn't, I should just put water. Tap water, get a water filter. Berkey is a great option. Um, you know, glyphosate, we're gonna talk about that, but that's in your water. It's going into us, it's going into your pets, it's in the water supply. Dewormers, flea and tick preventatives, any type of drug, antibiotics, stress, they all lead to leaky gut. So let's start with diet. So the main dietary contrib contributors to leaky gut, so these are going to be your highly processed grain-based foods and food additives. So this is like preservatives and colorings. So like red dye five or whatever it is, red five. And then you have your other colorings. You're, you're not seeing vitamin E, rosemary used for your preservatives. Uh, you see a thoxiquin as a preservative. Super toxic. Shouldn't be in your pet's food. The ingredients that can cause most often the damage for in your, G, your pet's GI tract, those are gonna be the proteins found in non-sprouted grains, sugar, genetically modified organisms, so GMOs, and also conventional dairy products. So if you're giving your pet milk, you may wanna take a hard long look at, is this cow's milk or can we switch to goat's milk, which we're gonna talk about. And the other scary part about this is even if you don't see these things listed on the ingredient, on the packaging as ingredients, most food animals are fed these foods. So they're gonna be in your dog's food too. Yep, that's unfortunate. So, and then also there's the glyphosates. And that's a huge problem in the world today. It's directly leading to dysbiosis because it's killing the good bac bacteria. It's killing everything actually. It's actually leading to antibiotic resistance. Glyphosate Roundup is leading to more antibiotic resistance and it's affecting the way the nutrients are absorbed in the body. It's a major problem. So unsprouted grains, let's go back to those. Those contain large amounts of what we call lectins. And lectins are a sugar binding protein that attach to the intestinal lining and they damage the gut causing inflammation. Wheat, rice, spelt, and soy, are com they commonly contain lectins and they're found in many grains and plants. And then carbohydrates with a higher glycemic load, so they have higher sugar contents, also lead to leaky gut. 
And these are a preferred source of food for pathogenic bad bacteria, the bad guys. So we don't want our pets eating this. So pets that are eating a diet high in soluble carbs, they're gonna suffer from unbalanced bacteria in the gut or what we call dysbiosis. So we need to be looking at the pet food ingredients. You need to learn how to read the pet food labels if you don't already know how to do that. We have to know if we need to be avoiding that food for our pet's overall health and to support and manage their gut health. Glyphosate is an herbicide, but it's also an antibiotic. It's used in pet feed. And this, the numbers, the statistics are insane at the amounts of what's in our food. So we need to be aware of this. This is a problem. So glyphosate's found nearly in all pet foods that contain grains or legumes or oats or potatoes. So some of the ingredients that have the highest glyphosate content, those are gonna be your non-organic oats, wheat, soy, potatoes, and legumes. So if you're seeing chickpeas, peas, lentils, beans, and peanuts, there's gonna be glyphosate in there. And it's found in most grains. So if you see corn, corn's going to be sprayed with glyphosate. Make sure you're choosing organic foods. That is the key. Now, not everyone can buy organic for everything, and I understand that. It can get really expensive. So these are the ones that we wanna be focusing on. If we're using them, make sure you're using the organic or you're avoiding these foods as much as you can in your pet's food. So even the non-GMO foods have been shown to have glyphosate in them, which is super scary. The reason for that is your oats and a lot of your legumes that are non-GMO foods, so we were under the belief that this is a good thing, right? We want non-GMO. However, the way that those plants are harvested, they're sprayed with glyphosate at the end of harvest to dry the plant, to harvest it, and to speed up the time of harvest to get it to the store to make money. The problem with that is, is now rather than like corn being sprayed at the very beginning, that's a GMO crop, like it's made to withstand glyphosate. That's what a GMO is made for. It doesn't die when it's sprayed with glyphosate. But these, these crops are sprayed at the end and they have higher concentrations of glyphosate. And now what's happening is a lot of these grain-free diets are predominantly legume based. That's what replaced the grains. And it's a very high concentration of glyphosate, especially for dogs that's going into their food and into their bodies. And it potentially leads to things like more lymphoma. It leads to bladder cancers, leukemias. There's all sorts of diseases that I am seeing so much more of because there's so much more glyphosate in our environment. We just talked about lectins and how those can increase the irritation in the GI tract and cause that inflammation and lead to leaky gut. So beans, peas, soybeans, lentils, other legumes, they have the highest lectin content of any food group. And same with members of the nightshade family. If you have pets that have chronic illness, inflammation, autoimmune disease, you wanna avoid the nightshade family. So this is things like peppers, potatoes, and tomatoes. So this is why it's so important to read those pet food labels looking for especially potatoes. But lectins also found in most grains with the exception of sorghum and millet. And then most dogs are actually gluten sensitive. In cats, we shouldn't be feeding them this anyways because they're obligate carnivores. They need meat for their diet. We need to get cats off of their carbs their dry food and get them onto an appropriate diet or we cause so many different diseases with that. So what happens when these pets are gluten sensitive and they come into contact with gluten, the small intestine actually produces zonulin. So this is a chemical that signals the tight junctions of the intestinal walls to open up, creating permeability. Now we have leaky gut. So we want to avoid gluten. And then we have mycotoxins. These are cancer-causing molds that grow on grains, legumes, and other starchy plants. And the fascinating thing is that Purina actually called them an unavoidable contaminant in pet foods. So another reason to hopefully steer away from these dry processed diets and start using more real food to help feed our pets. And then dairy. So most dogs don't produce the enzyme lactase, same with cats. 
And that's needed to actually digest the lactose and dairy products. So whey and casein are proteins in milk, and they also cause gut inflammation. And so we can use other sources of milk rather than cow milk. So we can use goat milk and sheep because they have a different type of casein and it makes it easier for your pet to digest and tolerate it. And so we still need to be careful though, if your pet is really sensitive to milk and you notice an upset tummy, they get gurgly, they get really gassy, goat and sheep milk are still high in lactose. So you need to be careful with that. And then vaccination, need I say more? We are over vaccinating our pets. And what's happening is, is those pets already have the antibodies to that vaccine that was given, or hopefully they do. And then we're revaccinating, and then we're revaccinating, and we're doing like five or six different vaccines all at one time. I'm not here to say that vaccines are bad, because they're not. They're necessary to help prevent disease, but we need to be vaccinating appropriately and smartly, and we need to be asking for titers. I wish more veterinary clinics were doing titers, but we need to be asking for a vaccine titer. What a vaccine titer is, is a blood test that actually checks for the antibodies against that disease we're vaccinating for. If your pet has antibodies against the disease that we were going to vaccinate for, they don't need that vaccine. Their body will be able to, or should be able to mount an immune response to that disease. Now it's not 100% guarantee, but nothing in life is, right? But we need to be looking at these titers rather than just vaccinating our pets over and over and over again. Studies have actually shown that vaccines can last at least seven years and probably for the life of the pet. So keep that in mind, but we need to give at least one of those vaccines and then tighter just to make sure your pet is protected because there's so much parvo, there's so much distemper, there's rabies out there. We want to make sure your pet is protected if they do come into contact with one of these diseases that can be deadly or make them really, really sick. Steroids, medications, Steroids are overused, especially for allergic skin disease. So steroids inhibit several important GI processes. They also suppress the immune system. And so this can lead to overgrowth of pathogens and then it causes even more life-threatening diseases to occur. Have you ever had a dog have steroids and you're giving the steroids and all of a sudden now they're drinking a ton of water, they wanna eat everything, their behavior's all like messed up, they're like crazy. Steroids affect so many different things and it contributes to leaky gut. So we need to be careful with what is being given. Ask your vet, if they're giving an anti-inflammatory, ask them specifically, is this a steroid? Is this a non-steroidal? And be aware of what they're giving rather than just letting the vet give an injection because it's going to affect your pet's overall health. So dewormers also cause dysbiosis flea and tick preventatives, they're pesticides, so they are going to affect gut health. So we need to be looking at the pros and cons. Does my pet need these medications? Because yes, they sometimes do. There is a time and a place for these. However, with flea and tick preventatives, make sure you truly need it or try the more natural alternatives first. So, and then of course, antibiotics. It's the number one reason and cause for dysbiosis. They are being overused. In the veterinary industry, in the human industry, we're seeing antibiotic resistance, which is also coming from glyphosate, which is being way overused in the environment. And guess what? 70% of our water is contaminated with glyphosate. It is an antibiotic. It's an herbicide. Not a good thing. They wipe out everything, good and bad bacteria. So we need to be more cognizant of what is going into our pets' bodies and also what's our, and going into our environment and what's surrounding us. Is your pet anxious? Dogs, cats, are you anxious? Oh my gosh, the times are crazy right now. So stress is running rampant amongst dogs, cats, people. Stress weakens the immune system and its ability to fight off foreign invaders, so bad bacteria, viruses, which is so big right now. And this leads to inflammation and leaky gut. So we need to be assessing environment, watching for signs of stress and addressing them and helping our pets, helping ourselves so we're not reducing our immune system also. Our pets are so connected to us and I see it over and over again with my clients where 
they have an upset stomach because of stress and then their dog and then their cat and then everyone's having diarrhea in the house and i'm like oh my gosh i'm just treating the pets but i need to treat you too so here's some calming tea everyone have a cup of calming tea and relax and diffuse some essential oils but it's i laugh but it's so important and it's something that we try we just push it aside but we really need to focus on reducing stress for ourselves and our pets because it'll fix so many any so many issues okay so what do we need to avoid first step is avoid any food that causes inflammation so stop feeding processed foods if we can we want to feed fresh preferably raw foods instead or at least we can do canned or a kibble diet with the smallest amount of carbs we want to be watching for those lectins, those GMO foods, the foods that are probably high in glyphosate and removing them, removing grains, but not replacing them with pea protein or peas, lowering the carbohydrate content and the sugars and the dairy from the diet. We also need to be, stop routinely vaccinating, but ask for titers instead to make sure our pets truly need it. And then use those natural alternatives instead for flea and tick preventatives. We don't need to use drugs for everything. See if there's other ways to treat your pet's condition through nutrition and herbs rather than just giving drugs. There's a lot of times where my patients come off of their medications because we were able to address the diet, the microbiome is fixed, and then we use herbs to assess and treat the root cause. So there's a lot we can do using and integrating holistic medicine into pet's treatment options. And then making sure that we're looking at environmental stressors. Is your pet getting enough exercise? Are the cats being stimulated enough? Do they have safe zones? If you've adopted a new kitten like I have and your older one's not super happy about it, do they have their own spaces? Do they have their own litter trays? These are all things we need to be looking at um, and making sure that we're, we're dealing with appropriately. I want you to meet a patient of mine, so Stella. Stella is the adorable little black lab in the background. She has severe phobia of tiled floors. Yes, so uncarpeted floors. Won't walk on them, just stops and acts like, like it's volcano lava. Does not wanna walk on them. And what we did is we actually looked at, she was on a kibble diet and it was one of the bigger brands. I mean, she didn't have any other symptoms. Um, but she had the severe anxiety. And so we looked at her microbiome. We used some supplements. We used some nutraceuticals and we changed her diet and we put her on herbs also. And we were able to get her to a point where she could walk on these floors. She was still a little hesitant and sometimes it would come out again where her fear would come out. But for the most part, she felt a lot better. That's where that link between gut health and the brain is so big. The gut makes serotonin. It makes a lot of those neurotransmitters that are going to affect anxiety and other behavioral issues. Yes, there's multifactorial components that we need to utilize when we're looking at behavior issues. It's not all about, I'm gonna feed a real food diet and I expect my pet's anxiety and behavior problems to disappear. Probably not gonna happen. We need to look at other things too but we can help heal the gut. So it makes it easier that the other things are going to work. Hopefully you found that video insightful and helpful for navigating your dog and cat's gut health. There are a lot of different factors that can take part in whether or not that ecosystem, that microbiome, the immune system, that emotional health side, that connection is at optimal levels. And you may be wondering like, well, my dog is still itching. They're still getting ear infections, or maybe your cat's over grooming. And you feel like there's more that you need to figure out and to really find that root cause. If that's you, then I definitely recommend checking out our Better Gut Health program. It's a self-paced program where you'll be able to dive deeper into how everything is interconnected to figure out why your dog and cat may be experiencing gut health problems, allergies, itchiness, recurring ear infections, and even anal gland problems. You'll get all the tools, the resources, and most importantly, the frameworks that I use to help pet parents 
figure out where those root causes are and truly heal them at the root cause level. So make sure you click the link down below in the description to learn more and to get on the path to helping your pet thrive naturally.